Ich zähle da rein. Eins. Schönen guten Abend, herzlich willkommen zu unserer Good evening and welcome to our book review. Rosa Jochmann, political activist and contemporary witness. I will have the conversation with Dr. Veronica Duma, and this is an event on behalf of the 76th. Um, anniversary of the liberation at the Ravensbrück Memorial. As you might have noticed, it is an online event. And uh, since we cannot meet in person, we decided to have this event online. You can find our program online on our website, Remember Liberation, but also ravensbrück.de. But since you are here and you are listening to us, you've probably found these websites. Let me start um, with giving you an overview of uh, tonight. I would like to introduce Veronika Duma first. She will give her book review that she has already prepared. This is a film that we are going to share. It's 29 minutes long. And after that, we can uh, get discuss together. You have two possibilities to join our discussion. You can use the YouTube chat feature if you are logged in on YouTube. And this is something that happens to me very often because I keep forgetting my password. You can use Slido. You just click on the Slido link in the YouTube chat um, and you can ask your question through Slido. Und insgesamt dauert unsere Veranstaltung etwa and our event will be around 60 minutes long. Let me introduce our guest for tonight, Veronika Duma from Frankfurt. She is the one who conducted the study about Rosa Jochmann, who used to be a political, who was a political activist and a contemporary witness. Uh, Veronika Duma uh, is a research associate at the Chair on the History and Impact of the Holocaust. She uh, researches uh, on topics like how to deal with um, national socialism, how was the situation in Austria and also elsewhere. And she also researched on different topics uh, about women in these times. Tonight, we are going to talk about uh, this book. It has this beautiful cover. It's her dissertation that was published in 2019. And she also received an uh, award for this, the Kete Leichter Award. And uh, you will hear why this is such an important award. Today, Veronica works uh, in Frankfurt at the Chair on the History and Impact of the Holocaust. She is a research associate there. And she is currently um, working on her dissertation about, the, about Europe and also about the space or the area Europe. And I found it really interesting also to hear where she had an internship. Before we uh, start, I would like to ask you, how did you find this topic? Well, welcome from my side as well. Thank you for the friendly introduction. Well, how did I find my topic? Well, I had finished my history study and then I heard 
in the Association of the History of the Working Class Movement in Vienna that uh, there has been an estate by Rosa Jochmann uh, that was handed over to the archive and someone was really uh, in need to look after it. I thought about it, then I said, all right, I'll do it. It was a project for a year, but very soon I found out that this is impossible to do within a year. We uh, discovered so much material that uh, was full of promising uh, departures for uh, historical research, and I turned it into my di dissertation then. So you had your sources and you based the book on your sources, exactly. So may I invite you then to give us the uh, introduction to your uh, book and present the book to us. So the video was taken beforehand, so let's look and listen. Let's watch and listen. Hello and welcome. I am Veronika Duma and I look forward to presenting the biography Rosa Jochmann, Political Act and Contemporary Witness as part of this year's celebration to mark the liberation of Ravensbrück concentration camp. Rosa Jochmann was imprisoned at Ravensbrück for five years. Today, I'd like to concentrate on those years of her life she had to spend there. I also want to look at her activities as a witness and contemporary witness up until the 1990s. So who was Rosa Jochmann? Rosa Jochmann lived from 1901 to 1994. She was a well-known social democrat in Austria, but also beyond. She held several political functions. She was a member of the party executive of the Austrian Social Democratic Party as early as 1934, but also after liberation up until the 1960s. After the ban of the party, she was active in the revolutionary socialists the successor organization during Austro-Fascism. She was a member of parliament until the 1960s and also until then chair of the women's group of the Social Democratic Party. At the same time, she was active in several historical political roles, for example, in the Association of Socialist Freedom Fighters and Victims of Fascism until the 1990s. This was the Association of the Victims of Political Persecution and Camp Survivors of the Social Democrats. She was active in the Ravensbrück Camp Association and the managing director of the Documentation Center of Austrian Resistance. As a politician and contemporary witness, she was committed to fighting racism, anti-Semitism, and fascism. In the top right-hand corner, we see Rosa Jochmann in 1945 during a party conference, the first one of the Social Democrats after liberation. Below, we see Rosa Jochmann in the second half of the 1980s, speaking at a demonstration and rally against Kurt Waldheim, the Austrian president who was an of officer in the Wehrmacht and represents the so-called victim theory in Austria, which is the notion that Austria was the first victim of the Nazis. A historical political initiative against this is formed in the 1980s and she's one of its leaders. So what will I talk about today? What can you expect? I first want to say a few words about the sources that are the foundation of the biography. I then briefly want to present Rosa Jochmann's life between the two world wars to highlight the continuity of her political practice. I then want to focus on the chapter on the women's concentration camp at Ravensbrück and the chapter on her role as witness and contemporary witness and will conclude with a few thoughts on the politics of commemoration and dealing with the past. My sources. The main source was Rosa Jochmann's estate, which is mainly kept at the Association for the History of the Workers' Movement in Vienna, but also in the Documentation Center of Austrian Resistance in Vienna. I also visited several archives in Germany and Austria. For example, the City and State Archive in Vienna, which holds court documents on political persecution during Austro-fascism, the State Archive of North Rhine-Westphalia in Düsseldorf, which has files on Cecilia Helton, her Lebensmensch, whom I'll also be introducing, Hamburg State Archive, the Stasi Archive in Berlin, but primarily also the archives of Rosenbrück Memorial. I was also allowed to visit several private archives. 
As a result, I had a wide range of source material covering nearly a century. There were official sources such as police statements and court files documented from the Nazi period, media sources, newspaper articles and publications by parties and organizations, but above all, a lot of autobiographical material such as correspondence, such as letters, diary entries, interviews, and all the statements Rosa Jochmann made as a contemporary witness. Rosa Jochmann grew up in Vienna in a workers' family at the turn of the century and lived through the First World War during her young years. Her parents died young and being the oldest sister, she took on responsibility for her siblings and the household. From the age of 14, she worked in several factories, was active in the trade union and quickly rose through its ranks. Once this was possible, she also became a paid party functionary for the Social Democrats. After the First World War, she witnessed the successful struggle for the right to vote. And when the war had ended, subsequent improvements of living conditions under the emerging welfare state in the First Republic and especially in Red Vienna. Red Vienna describes the period from 1990 to 1934 when the Social Democrats held the absolute majority in Vienna and implemented a comprehensive reform program until 15 years later, in 1934, it was broken up by Austro-Fascism, which is the Austrian variant of fascism. The interwar years were not only marked by a strong women's and workers' movement and the rise of social democracy in Vienna and Austria, but also by two global economic crises and the rise of right-wing authoritarian and fascist forces throughout Europe. In Austria, this took the form of Austro-Fascism and the, nationalist, so the National Socialists had also come to the fore by then. Rosa Jochmann and her political environment observed the rise of fascism and National Socialism in Europe, with a particular eye on Austria, but also Italy and Germany, and actively opposed authoritarian tendencies of the Austrian government early on. They also stood up against National Socialism, which was gaining strength as early as the 1930s. For example, Rosa Jochmann spoke at rallies and joined demonstrations against Nazi marches that often ended in violence. In 1933, Rosa Jochmann wrote an article on Nazi violence in Germany and ended with a warning that in future, the head of humanity will shudder over the misdeeds of National Socialism. After the elimination of parliamentary democracy in Austria by the ruling Christian Social Party, and the quashing of the February uprising in 1934, which was an uprising of mostly social democratic and communist workers against Austro-Fascism. The Social Democratic Party was prohibited, but Rosa Jochmann remained active underground and continued her work. In, in 1934, she was sentenced to 15 months in prison. On her release, she continued her work once again illegally and also did so, although less intensively, after the so-called Anschluss, the annexation of Austria into Nazi Germany. During Nazi rule, she was again arrested in 1939, this time by the Gestapo. There are a few pictures here. This one is a picture of Rosa Jochmann's family at the turn of the 20th century. On the right, we see Rosa Jochmann in front of a microphone during a Schutzbund rally. This was the paramilitary arm of the Social Democratic Party in the 1930s. On the bottom left is Rosa Jochmann's forged ID card when she was illegal in 1934, so still during Austrofascism. In the right-hand corner is a cell from the 1930s, a prison cell in Vienna. And at the center, we see an extract from a headline in the workers' newspaper where Rosa Jochmann is announced as a speaker against the National Socialist Rally. Rosa Jochmann was arrested by the Gestapo already in 1939. In spring 1940, she was deported from the police prison in Vienna, the Rossauer Lende, to the women's concentration camp at Ravensbrück, where she was imprisoned until its liberation. She was never an ordinary prisoner, but was immediately made block elder 
which he remained for three years, specifically block elder of the political bloc. In this position, he was part of the system of prisoner functionaries. This meant the systematic use of prisoners by the SS to enforce camp rule. Prisoners were used for a range of work, such as construction and maintenance tasks, administrative functions, supply, surveillance, and punishment. The functionary system was based on the intentional creation of hierarchy among the prisoners with the aim of desolidarization and isolation. In the literature, the idea of prisoner functionaries, this precarious space between SS and fellow prisoners, is described as a gray zone or zone between resistance and collaboration. On the one hand, it was possible to help other prisoners by organizing food, medicines and clothes, as it was called by the prisoners. On the other, there was always the danger of being punished individually or collectively if the prisoners didn't comply with SS orders. And obviously, prisoner functioners were closer to the SS guards than prisoners without function. In Rosa Jochmann's memories and personal narratives, it's always Kate Leichter, a social democrat, who instructed her on her task as block elder. Who was Kate Leichter? She was an Austrian socialist and scientist who had been deported to Ravensbrück from Vienna five months prior to Rosa Jochmann, and who was a hugely important anchor and friend to her. As a Dress, she was murdered in 1942 in Bernburg at the sanatorium and mental hospital, together with a large part of the so-called Jewish bloc at the Ravensbrück concentration camp. As a contemporary witness, Rosa Jochmann states, when I arrived at the camp, Kata told me, Rosa, you'll be block elder of the political bloc, but you are not the council for the poor, you are not the works council either, you are the extended arm of the SS. And you always have to agree with the SS, but you must try to make sure that the guard does not report anything. What she's describing here is the difficult balancing act between subordination to the SS on protecting the prisoners she's responsible for in order to increase their chance of survival. Remembering Katie Leichter helped her to talk about her role as block elder. Overall, other prisoners described the political bloc under the leadership of Rosa Jochmann as a place of refuge from the SS, as a place of refuge from the conditions in other parts of the camp. Innumerable statements made by fellow prisoners emphasized this. Thank you letters sent from the GDR, the Soviet Union, the Netherlands, letters that came from different countries and from former camp children who described her as Camp Mum or Blokova Rosel. Here we see Rosa Jochmann in a commemorative event at Ravensbrück Memorial in front of the so-called bunker. This was the concentration camp's prison. <clears throat> the political prisoners built a network of solidarity and resistance around Rosa Jochmann. Of course, there were several such networks in the case of Rosa Jochmann. Cecilia Helden, a communist from North Rhine-Westphalia, played an important role. She became a room orderly under Rosa Jochmann as block elder. Together, the women tried to organize food, clothing, and medicines for the political bloc. Rosa Jochmann remembers our bloc had a lot more than all the other blocs because I organized together with Silly. When loaves of bread were counted and when things were fetched, I always engaged the supervisor in talking, taking half as much bread extra to our block than we should have had. When the women of the Red Army were brought to the Ravensbrück camp in 1943, the political prisoners, in particular the prisoner functionaries, tried to make contact. Several survivors reported on help that had been organized by Rosa Jochmann and Cecilia Helton for the Soviet women. Rosa Jochmann and Cecilia Helton also looked after the so-called camp children that had been housed in the political bloc. In the late 1970s, Ursula Kutaba Pietras, for example, who had been deported from Poland and was a child at the time, remembers Jochmann's and Helton's leadership of the political bloc in a letter to Rosa. When you and Silly dished out the soup and it was the turn of us youngsters, you always dipped the ladle deeper as the soup was thicker nearer the bottom. Only much later, long afterwards, did I realize 
what this injustice must have cost you. So many starving eyes were looking at that ladle. How much you taught us youngsters also in terms of self-education. What she means here, what she describes in more detail in her letter to Rosa is that in the political bloc, even children were taught to follow certain rules. This was training that also helped to survive the camp. For example, she writes, children were taught in inverted commas, discipline and body hygiene as a survival technique, which were actually practices of resistance, resistance against the systematic humiliation and degradation and attempts at dehumanization. This included throwing away spoiled food despite permanent hunger, washing in icy cold water, even in winter, and keeping clothes clean as far as this was possible. In spring 1943, the Gestapo and the camp broke up this network of support around Rosa Jochmann and Silly Helton, and Rosa and other prisoner functionaries were interrogated and locked up in the so-called bunker, where Rosa Jochmann survived six months in darkness. When she was released back into the camp, her health had deteriorated. She suffered from typhus and was nursed back to health by fellow prisoners, which prevented her from being sent to the infirmary, which she probably would, where she probably would have been murdered. Because of her weakness, she could not retake her position as block elder at the political block, but was transferred to the industrial yard at the back of the camp where Silly Helton had since become block elder and had to do forced labor there in the SS workshops. In her memories after 1944, she focuses less on the period after 1943 and more on the period before 1943 when she was block elder. She generally spoke more of moments when she felt herself capable of action. She is less vocal on situations where she was at somebody's mercy. This is exemplified in a comment she makes as a contemporary witness in which she often repeats, suddenly I was one of the crowd, I couldn't help anymore. Kete Jonas, a communist and first president of the Ravensbrück Camp Association in Germany, remembered that when she was deported to Ravensbrück in 1944, after long years of persecution, they brought Silly Helton and Rosa Jochmann from the access block to the industrial yard. She remembered the first time she met Helton and Jochmann and writes, On the afternoon of this first day, our unforgotten silly introduced me to our Rosal. In a few short words, I'm informed of the terrible situation in the camp and the rules of the camp life. Rosal and silly tell me, you'll make it if I only if only you want to. Here we see Rosa Jochmann and Silly Helton in the 1970s. Rosa Jochmann describes Silly Helton as her Lebensmensch and central person in her life. They shared a flat in Vienna until Helton's death in 1974. Rosa Jochmann as a witness and contemporary witness. Directly after the war, Rosa Jochmann, like many other survivors, spoke out publicly as a contemporary witness. Together with other survivors, especially others from Ravensbrück, she organized the Austrian Camp Association. This especially brought political prisoners together and the women documented and passed on the history of the camp. In Austria, they were part of the education efforts by former resistance fighters who, together with the camp association, put forward a counter narrative to the prevailing victim theory, the idea of Austria as a first victim of national socialism. Together, they collected evidence and made statements in courts and on Nazi crimes especially during the Ravensbrück trials that took place between 1946 and 1950 and again in 1966. They mainly focused on the legal reconstruction of events. I want to emphasize 
that these investigations and court proceedings didn't just focus on the SS and Nazi functionaries, but also the prisoner functionaries themselves. Often these legal investigations were lengthy and it often was one person's word against another's. Rosa Jochmann was frequently contacted during investigations and before court proceedings as a witness to the behavior of different, different prisoners. She also stood up for quite a few defendants, at least against the death penalty for former prisoners, even when they were prisoner functionaries, by attempting to explain their ambivalent position. This concerned the cases of Clara Pferch, who was head of the camp police at Ravensbrück, Elisabeth Turi, or Marianne Scharinger. As former block elder, she called on former fellow prisoners in several circular letters to help clear up crimes and to take an active part in criminal proceedings by giving statements. Something many didn't want to do because they were keen initially to put some distance between them and past events. Here we see Rosa Jochmann in 1945, shortly after she arrived in Vienna. As a political actor and contemporary witness, Rosa Jochmann was familiar with having to tell her life story. She was what you might call a trained narrator, but there's no autobiography. This is fairly unusual as many of the former camp prisoners published autobiographical stories and memories in the form of a book. In some cases, Rosa Jochmann encouraged them to do this and she occasionally read their manuscripts. It is no coincidence that there was renewed interest in autobiographical memories in the 1970s and 80s, which is to do with the optimistic mood of the late 1960s, a strong oral history project, interest in women's history and fresh interest in forgotten life histories created a climate motivating many women to consider memory, their memories worth telling. There are many autobiographical notes in Rosa Jochmann's estate, memories and fragments of autobiographical writing. Comments made by Rosa Jochmann indicate that she was working on an autobiography, but that she later destroyed it. According to her, this was triggered by an incident within the Social Democratic Party, but she doesn't give an exact date or name any names. But in the 1980s, she tells her good friend, Rainer Meyerhofer, there was a moment when the statement of a comrade finished me, a comrade who had no idea of all the suffering. And I went home. Now I can normally control myself and I'm never visibly angry. But then remembering all the awfulness, I was literally overcome by madness. And I stood in my office and I'm telling only you, I cried like an animal and tore up everything because even comrades are doubting we've been to hell. In order to understand the destruction of her autobiography, we need to ask which memories are speakable and wanted and when should one keep silent on the past? All of this is relevant with a view to the politics of memory and commemoration, the lack of engagement with the Nazi past, and in particular also how social democracy dealt with this past, as social democracy where many social issues came together for Rosa Jochmann. This event, which she mentions, made her call into question her existence as a witness and contemporary witness. She didn't use her desperation and anger to distance herself or to trigger a scandal. Instead, she destroyed her notes. Here we see the Ex Libris of Rosa Jochmann, which was drawn by friends and which shows her stations en route home to Vienna from Ravensbrück concentration camp. So why differentiate between speaking as a witness and as a contemporary witness? Within research, there's consensus nowadays that the current understanding of contemporary witness only emerged in the early 90s, 80s, and, this, and that it was caused by a historical political turnaround. As a result, new spaces for speaking and for being heard emerged. These socio-political changes of the 1970s and 80s have several dimensions. I just want to briefly highlight some, for example, the questions asked of history. 
I already mentioned this in the context of the social optimism that accompanied the social movements of the 1960s, where the oral history project triggered strong interest in marginalized life histories. Then there were medial triggers in the US but also in Germany and Austria, when the US television, television series Holocaust was broadcast in Germany and Austria in the late 1970s. And this triggered a public debate and a huge medialization on how history is taught. In Austria, another aspect of the paradigm shift in the politics of memory was triggered by the protests against Waldheim and the Waldheim affair in 1986. This president who had been an officer in the Wehrmacht when a historical political offensive was brought into position against denial and forgetting. This turnaround made bearing witness almost synonymous with the life histories of Holocaust survivors in the public discourse. The narratives of contemporary witnesses are taking on moral authority while new demands are made of contemporary witnesses. For example, to be able to build a bridge between the present and the past. This means that memories are taken from the past, but that present values and frameworks are applied to them. Overall, the anti-fascist rhetoric, especially of former political prisoners, was replaced by survivors' testimonies. But Rosa Jochmann was able to navigate this new context very well. The birth of the contemporary witness, and it is called by Sabroin Frey, opened up new spaces for her to act, to speak and to be heard beyond active party politics, which she quit in older age. This was in the late 1960s. In the 1980s, she was also referred to as a contemporary witness, especially after the series Holocaust was broadcast on Australian television, she was overwhelmed with invitations to speak at contemporary witnesses as a contemporary witness at schools and various institutions. A statement by Rosa Jochmann regarding an invitation to speak at a school is indicative of the new way of speaking, namely that she is not political, but only speaks as a contemporary witness. She says, since the Holocaust series, I have given more than 200 talks at schools, at secondary schools, not politically, I only speak as a witness of that time, which means I try to explain to young people how difficult life becomes when democracy is abolished. Rosa Jochmann was a tireless contemporary witness well into old age, always also pursuing an autobiographical motive, which is mentioned repeatedly by many survivors, namely their duty to keep alive the memory of those died, of those who died. This is exemplified in this quote from the 1980s. My old age philosophy is, Rosa, you got away and therefore you have to live up to the duty you shouldered back then. You will speak out, you will not be silent. Here we see Rosa Jochmann in Mordzin Square in Vienna, where there is a memorial to the victims of the Gestapo, because the Gestapo building was there at that time. Some final thoughts on the politics of the past and commemoration. Rosa Jochmann didn't see the politics of the past as curating a closed chapter of history, but always as a starting point for intervention in the current political situation. And all her life, she was active against the rise of right-wing extremism and neo-Nazi forces. She was an uncompromising opponent of the FPÖ, the Austrian right-wing party with an extremist wing and proximity to neo-Nazis. She also supported internationalism and her activities were international. In the late 1950s, she traveled to the USSR on the invitation of the Russian Women's Camp Association, was active in the Chile Solidarity Movement together with Silly Helton and active in the Solidarity Movement of Nicaragua. She was politically active and committed to the politics of commemoration well into old age. In 1993, she supported a large demonstration organized by SOS Mitmensch against a racist public referendum organized by the FPÖ, which became known as the Sea of Life 
and was one of the largest public demonstrations the Second Republic had seen. As a 29-year-old, she gave a speech against anti-Semitism and right-wing extremism. That was her last big public statement. Rosa Jochmann actively shaped the discourse on commemoration in Austria. As a contemporary witness, she was a voice against forgetting, suppression, and relativization. She was a political actor and contemporary witness for almost a century. Thank you for listening. Welcome back to our round table for a discussion with Veronika Duma, whom you just saw in the film and the presentation. Many thanks and thank you for making it available to us in advance. Um, what I realized is that we have collected quite a few voices of survivors for the anniversary, but this is now uh, an additional dimension, children in the camp um, and so forth, very young people. But Rosa Jochmann had uh, an experienced political life already lived to the full, and she had an idea of how to fight and how to build networks. We also uh, heard something about the difficult role she had in the camp as a prisoner functionary and also after liberation. Her role as a contemporary witness and a political activist prompts the question, how does that go together? Or should it be kept secret? Uh, should it be uh, kept separate? Well, everyone uh, watching us on YouTube Please uh, know that you sh are able to ask questions, which you can do through the chat function in on YouTube. And if you are not registered, there's a link uh, at the bottom of the page. You can click on the Slido uh, app and it opens and you can uh, type your question in and I'll be able to read. I received one question already. But there is one I would like to ask first, if you permit me doing so. I know from Germany and German politics that very often political actors uh, who had been persecuted uh, under national socialism uh, not necessarily made that obvious in her political engagement after the war because they didn't want to confront the majority society um, directly. You uh, said very clearly that uh, Rosa Jochmann was a contemporary witness and political activist. Were these two roles or how did you find a way to connect the two? I think the link, establishing the link is a rather late achievement. On the contrary, I think uh, she must have been in terrible conflicts, which uh, were also the reason why she destroyed her autobiographical notes. Of course, she did play an important role within the networks of survivors in Austria and beyond. And she tried very actively to be a voice of the survivors, not just of the political prisoners, but also of all the others, to uh, make that voice heard. Uh, to make it public and uh, she knew that uh, the, she would be heard and until the 1960s she was very engaged party politician she had high ranking positions and it was a very constructive relationship but it was full of conflicts because within the party were different views she came from the left wing and uh, together with other survivors, she tried to strengthen that uh, topic within the party and, and make the comrades aware of it, but she failed because of right-wing positions in the Social Democratic Party. Voices said, well, now that's uh, enough, let's put pay to it all. At the same time, she was also uh, caught between the front lines uh, of others. Uh, she tried to... Uh, commemorate the victims and this is something that should have been uh, not just a party position but 
the, the social democrats communists conservatives others liberals uh, they were all in, involved but in their high time of uh, the cold war uh, these were political front lines that uh, uh, were very strong uh, she was also confronted with anti-communism within the party where she had to take a stand, but she still wanted to uh, maintain contacts that were not just political ones. So that must have been, uh, there must have been a lot of friction involved for her. Well, I'll learn one day, Mrs. Guinness says. Well, we got a question from Elka Amelsberger who will be holding two events in our digital anniversary commemoration. She asked, wasn't Rosa Jochmann herself on trial after 1945, uh, having been a prisoner functionary? No, she was not on trial personally. I read a lot of letters and I think I understood uh, that the only uh, responses to her work in the uh, camp were positive. They, they were uh, always uh, positive, but she was often called upon to say something about other prisoner functionaries. For example, Car Clara Perch, where she very strongly tried to argue, well, she didn't say she was innocent. Uh, of course, she said she beat other prisoners, she collaborated with the SS, but she pointed out that uh, the death sentence was definitely too much in that context. In the 1950s, she also uh, voted against the introduction of the death penalty in Austria. What I did find um, was an uh, attempt to slander her uh, but this had more to do with the events in the camp, uh, a Gestapo spy, the efforts to destroy the network, and she tried to fight back. So obviously that person tried to uh, drag Rosa Jochmann into all this to uh, say, uh, save her own back. So no one else uh, supported that uh, slander. That's what I wondered as well. It's a very difficult uh, topic, very difficult to discuss. And as you said before, um, uh, she found herself in a difficult position within uh, in the Cold War. Was it possible at all for her to describe the ambiguity of a prisoner functionary in public, or was her only chance to um, speak about the network in the camp and uh, the solidarity and the, the work they did in the camp, supporting others. Well, she stressed this ambiguity, this ambivalence. She was aware of it. She spoke about it, that it was a permanent challenge. Uh, but she always stressed that uh, there, uh, there have never been any claims that she beat others, uh, but she focused also on the task to, uh, of the prisoner functioners to maintain discipline. This was important that there was no uh, pretext to report anything to the SS, that everything looked all right to the outside. And this discipline, of course, had something to do with massive pressure. She spoke of one example when a new prisoner sent to the political bloc stole a potato from one of the uh, others and threatened to report it uh, to the uh, SS guard and uh, Rosa Jochmann sanctioned her by ignoring that woman uh, completely, so kind of socially marginalizing that uh, woman. And it was Im very important to stay in contact, but when someone got outside the community, she, that woman find, found herself in the situation to apologize to all the others because she had understood that she wouldn't be able to stand it alone. But then we need to stress what you said here, that it was always about trying to uh, do things together and get through it together. 
You also describe in your book that uh, Rosa Jochmann was a very important person within the uh, Ravensbrück camp community, but she sometimes found herself in difficulties, even there. Uh, that sounded very interesting to me, especially when we talk about the early years after the war. Well, the whole thing has several dimensions. She tried from the very beginning to be active in this uh, association of survivors um, uh, the Ravensbrück camp community comprised lots of communists and there was a big conflict there namely the narrative who exactly supported the resistance most of all and i think i can come back to that a little later eventually this has something to do with the inner political conflict conflict. There was a huge uh, uh, competition between this Social Democratic Party in Austria and the Communists, not only in Austria, but also elsewhere. But this conflict also determined the relationship within the camp community, because Rosa Jochmann had excellent contact with other, uh, with others, with communists, with uh, surviving Yugoslavs uh, in the GDR, the states of the what we now call the former Soviet Union. And she was willing to maintain, foster and cultivate these contacts beyond the camp community. And she wrote letters and went on visits. And this doesn't go along with what these conflicts within the camp community entailed. And uh, at the same time, the conflict was, as I mentioned, about who was uh, most active in the resistance movement. Well, in 1943, Rosa Jochmann was the uh, block elder and then was betrayed by a spy, not only her, but uh, a lot of other block elders and the functionaries, the prisoner functionaries were put into the bunker, into the bunker. So the network was smashed once fall. And it was terribly difficult after surviving the bunker in the first place to make contact again and resistance plays a very important role in the Austrian uh, party, but uh, the, the, there's a mix of the different years. So um, obviously party political conflicts overshadowed uh, her activities for many years. It was relevant to her. It ended uh, with a narrative of uh, resistance to the SS, but the party political conflicts were over one day, the Cold War, uh, was over, uh, the political turnaround happened, so the ideological front lines were not as strong as they used to be, and uh, shortly before that Rosa Jochmann dropped out of active party politics, so the focus now was less on the political actors, but on uh, the actors that uh, need to uh, play a role as contemporary witnesses. So the co uh, uh, cooperation between the various associations, the uh, f establishment of an archive and so on and so forth. I think this is an important point that we find in early literature and the uh, stories women write, there must have been strong conflicts within the camp between the various groupings. And this was not just between the national groups, but also between the political groups. Which leads me to another question. Uh, her network that you described. You quote a, a, a Polish woman, but also uh, a German speaking a number of German voices. Was your network mainly German or was she also internationally networked? Interesting question indeed. She was a political person with lots of contacts into the camp. And so this helped her to get that position early. She came from Austria and of course, uh, there she had most of her contacts. But uh, the Austrian party had a lot of international contacts. She was part of the international working class movement. She was at least informed about what was happening elsewhere. 
but uh, close personal contacts with Austrians. This really changed after 1945. Uh, the letters re she gets and writes, they come from many different places, of course, mainly from German speaking countries, but she also has friends in Yugoslavia, the USSR, the camp children mostly came from the areas in the former Soviet Union. So she had uh, the, the whole breadth of nations in Europe among her contacts and friends. Und Text zusammenbringen. Das bringt uns ähm, genau zu einer Frage meiner Which takes us to the question asked by my uh, colleague uh, Sabina Arendt, who would like to thank you for your contribution. And then she writes, she sent circular letters to former um, fellow, uh, fellow prisoners uh, and signs with uh, your Blokova. Uh, at one conference, she's uh, cooperate uh, she's criticized for not being cooperative what is your view on such letters she was not part of the work process work process meaning the work at the memorial so no the work in the the the, the forced labor in the camp i don't know precisely who accused her of that what i know is that there are different reasons for that. I know that there were clashes concerning political organization on the part of communists. The communists tried to do political training uh, uh, courses, at the least that's what I found. While she said, this is not the most sensitive thing to do right now. Uh, it was now, uh, how do we survive? That's all. But I must say, uh, who criticized her for what? This is something that is now new to me, and I would have to look it up. And of course, there's not so there's not so much left from uh, the camp itself when it comes to conflicts like that. But but I can imagine there is a lot uh, of conflicts we know very little about yet. Uh, mit Margarete Bube Neumann, uh, another activist at the same time, she was uh, the secretary of uh, the chief supervisor and was arrested together with her. And Margarete Bube Neumann ha has been a red cloth for many uh, communists because she came to uh, the uh, concentration camp from the Soviet Union, was deported from there, and it. Uh, put pay to their hope that the Soviet Union is the better power. So uh, Rosa must have suffered from that because uh, an undogmatic person by and large. Uber Neumann was uh, definitely not that. So she was, at least Rosa Irma was open to criticism, which the other was not. This uh, also is the point of another question, I quote, how do you comment the accusations of Mrs. Lambrin's accusations, who claimed uh, she was a spy? So obviously, Rosa Jochmann was a target for very many different types of attacks. So what would you say about these accusations? It's rather the other way around. Uh, Rosa Lotte Lambrecht uh, has been accused of being a spy, as far as I found out, because the story goes that this network of solitary that was smashed in 1943 um, was busy with uh, different types of things than um, there were changes in the camp structure and the camp uh, staffing and Robert uh, uh, Lotte Lambrecht was uh, a prisoner herself, but uh, she worked uh, as a seamstress in the camp and many other prisoners have accused her of being responsible for the destruction of the uh, network in 1943. She was the spy in the political bloc. That was the uh, accusation. In the early 1940s, this conflict resurfaces because uh, a number of people are in uh, uh, on trial. Rosa 
Jochmann and many other survivors followed the trials in Hamburg and meet her there. So there was, there must have been a fierce debate as a result of which Rosa Jochmann uh, forces her to um, explain herself. And then uh, Lotte Lamy starts to write uh, defamatory letters, probably with the intention that she herself is in a very precarious situation. A number of investigations were started, not just by Rosa Jochmann and other political prisoners who tried to uh, report uh, against her, uh, but also uh, others uh, uh, close to uh, Lotte Labrich, who was actually then imprisoned. So these accusations uh, more or less fizzled out and uh, it didn't really come to anything. But uh, obviously, uh, Rosa Jochmann had to fight with lots of accusations because others wanted to save their own back. And uh, Lotte Lambrecht was never really um, uh, uh, sentenced to anything, but she could not uh, style herself as a resistance uh, uh, fighter. Uh, she tried to get uh, money as a victim of uh, uh, national socialism, and this is turned down. She never uh, profits from whatever she tried to do. Uh, one question deals with the Lebensmensch, the uh, life, life's partner that Rosa Jochmann had over many years. It's about the two positions, a political position and a lesbian position. What would you say about these two things? How do the, you uh, define that? Well, it depends. Well, in the camp itself, being lesbian doesn't play a role, obviously. Although there was, of course, strong homophobia also among prisoners when you read the uh, statements of survivors. For example, um, there are statements uh, that the uh, political prisoners uh, were in platonic love, whereas uh, the, uh, some others were um, in a moral love and for the time after liberation, uh, when Rosa Jochmann tried to live together with Silly Helton, she uh, wrote a book about, or she, she wrote an, an article about her own position in the camp. And then we have the history of uh, reception because uh, we have more about her from others than from herself. And I tried to contextualize that. But definitely Rosa Jochmann, well, she lived together with Silly Helton. She loved her. She called her her Lebensmensch. They were together at many political events. It was a friendship going back or love going back to the camp. But apart from that, she didn't say anything about that. And she didn't put it into any sort of context. All right, that seems to be an important uh, point. She's uh, the person of my life, not the person of her heart. And it was definitely not the kind of topic you would, discur you would discuss publicly at the time. So we are close to the end of our discussion. So I would like to uh, wind up with one question from Arnold Bielak. Where is it? Here. Are there reliable sources about the ways in uh, in which Jochmann became a prisoner functionary? Well, that's what I wondered myself. Why was it set to make her a prisoner functionary before she actually arrived there? The only thing I can imagine is that the political prisoners anyway held lots of positions within the self-administration of the camp and they uh, knew the list and knew who would be coming and those present there already before her put her on a position but how exactly that worked i was unable to find out 
Well, that's the way it is. There are unfortunately not sources for everything we want to know. But let me just say that this book is so interesting, written from different angles, and it really makes you uh, sit down and read it at one go. Uh, I do hope that we will have another discussion soon. One hour is definitely too short, and I would like to thank you very much, Veronika Duma, for your comments. I would also like to thank our listeners and uh, thank you for asking questions. Thank you for participating. And I would like to invite you very much to join us for uh, more of the events we have. We have uh, other uh, events on Austrian survivors, and I do hope that we have a chance to meet on the internet or to meet here in Ravensbrück in person anytime soon. Thank you very much and goodbye.